It is the great election year and financial markets the world over are keeping a close eye on developments. From the rise of populist movements to the policies implemented by governments, every decision has the potential to shape economies, influence investor sentiment and drive increased market volatility. So, with global election fever in full swing, what are the key elections that markets and investors are watching? Are they concerns and what are they priced in? I'm Jeremy Maggs. This is No Ordinary Wednesday. It's our in-depth look at what is driving markets, shaping the economy and changing the game. From South Africa, India, Iran to the United States, the European Union and the United Kingdom, it's a historic election year that will see over 60 countries go to the polls. This accounts for half the world's population and, most importantly, over 60% of global economic output. In this episode, we'll delve into the complex election dynamics at play and examine how they are likely to impact the global economy, financial markets and the broad investment landscape. To discuss the implications for global markets and strategies for navigating the resulting volatility, I'm joined by Investec Wealth and Investments Chief Investment Strategist Chris Holdsworth, who's going to look into what is driving investment decisions during this election uncertainty. Chris Holdsworth, a very warm welcome to No Ordinary Wednesday. So, Chris, South Africa faces the possibility, as we know, of a coalition government post the election. In the United States, Donald Trump is eyeing a comeback. In Britain, the Conservative Party widely expected to lose its grip on power to the Labour Party. Just a couple of the scenarios that are playing out globally. What then are the key elections that investors are watching, Chris, and why? Hi, Jeremy, and hi, everybody. There are a range of elections happening across the globe, all the way from Taiwan, which has happened already, and then we've got India, which takes six weeks to occur. They're in the midst of that at the moment. We've got South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, the UK, maybe at the end of this year, maybe the beginning of next year, and the US. And of all of those, and there's a whole bunch of others that have left out, the most important are probably the Taiwanese one, which has happened already. No real change. It's the same party, but a different individual, and the US. But broadly speaking, there's a common theme running through all the elections with regards to investor concerns, and that's around fiscal policy. Over the past decade or so, we've seen rising debt to GDP from most countries, a couple of exceptions, but most countries have seen rising debt to GDP. And at some point, we're likely to see that shift. At some point, governments are going to have to become more fiscally prudent which will be bad for equity markets and good for bond markets. So the question really is, is this a catalyst for that in a range of countries? So first and foremost, we've got to look at what happens in the US. But secondly, more broadly across the globe, we need to keep an eye on what's happening to fiscal policy. So Chris, in that respect then, are there strategies that investors can employ to hedge against the ambiguity that is brought about by this multiplicity of polls? It's a great question. The second aspect of these elections, the first being fiscal policy, is around the implications for geopolitics. There's a wide range of possible outcomes. We don't know what's going to occur. What we can say with some degree of certainty is that it's going to be a volatile year. And as a result, there is still a clear need for safe haven assets within portfolios, ignoring the valuation aspects of the market. And that covers asset classes like, for example, gold and certain alternatives, which offer structured payoffs, which offer protection in these sorts of environments. So in this era of heightened uncertainty, which we don't think is going to disappear shortly, there's definitely the need for an overweight allocation, in our view, towards alternative and safe haven assets. I don't need to say that when we are in a time like this, there is the danger of populism that has already been raised. The International Monetary Fund calling for fiscal restraint in the face of high government debt crisis across the board. Here in South Africa, we've seen dollar bonds plummet with concern over the election on the 29th of May. So broadly, then global bond markets would be unsettled, no doubt. There's an interesting dynamic at play across the globe at the moment with regards to fixed income. Credit spreads for corporates are pretty tight across the globe, despite the fact that we're seeing increasing bankruptcies. It's it's very anomalous for at this point of the cycle to see credit spreads as low as they are. If, for example, you look at investment grade credit, the spread over U.S. Treasuries is about 90 basis points, so less than 1%. And could lead one to question, why take the credit risk at all for, for investment grade credit? If you look at emerging markets, the spread that emerging market bonds trade over U.S. Treasuries is also very low by historical standards, which is also quite difficult to understand given how opaque the outlook is at the moment and given the risks that are out there. So we've got very high yields for U.S. Treasuries and very low spreads above that. And that does suggest that there's some degree of complacency in markets at this point 
And again, within the fixed income space, it's an argument for rather being in the safe haven assets, given that you don't have to give up too much relative to some of the more risky propositions. Chris, at a time like this, it's also an opportunity for people, if you'll excuse the cricket analogy, to put their pads on, glove up and uh, put the helmet on. They've obviously got to be potential opportunities for investors at a time like this. Yeah, absolutely, Jeremy. We think that there is quite a bit of opportunity out there. And funny enough, a lot of it is local. Where there's muck, there's brass. If you look at the local markets on a forward multiple of roughly half of that of the US, our bond yields, our RAND bond yields, unlike emerging market dollar bond yields, our RAND bond yields are very high relative to the US, an extra 8% or so. And then if you look at some components of the local market, like SA Inc. shares, for example, If load shedding this year is half of what it was last year, which I think is a conservative estimate, we think it could even be better than that, the cost of keeping the lights on roughly halves. And we'll see a lot of that drop through to to the bottom line. And that's very helpful for SA Inc., especially when one considers that there's a prospect of a rate cut towards the back end of the year as well. And valuation is very cheap. So, yeah, there, there certainly is opportunity. And we think our market in particular is one that's being neglected at this point. Chris, let me ask you to lift the horizon slightly for us. Obviously, at a time like this, we need to be cognizant of how it's going to shape decisions for the medium and long term. There's a long tail here. Yeah, and these elections globally will will have impacts for at least the next five years or so, or four to five, depending on the country that you look at. And I think there we we do need to look through that framework. We start at the top of the conversation. The first is fiscal policy and and the second is geopolitics. And I suspect, given the recent momentum, it's probably too soon for the trajectory that is of rising debt to GDP to be turned around immediately, in which case the the medium term is likely to be characterized by still quite significant deficits, particularly in the US, but more broadly across the globe, still rising debt to GDP, which means we get still continuing support over the medium term for equities. And that just pushes out the point at which there needs to be a reckoning. And at some point, either we need economies to grow more rapidly, or we need to see a wide range of countries start to put their foot on on the fiscal brake and either raise taxes or reduce expenditure. And I think that's what we're going to be looking out for as a risk for equities more broadly over the coming three to four years or so. Chris, I would imagine at a time like this, there are two mindsets as far as investors are concerned. One is complete inertia and the other is uh, just rushing for the hills in great excitement. What are the common mistakes that people make at a time like this? Anxiety, a period of uncertainty, and how do you avoid those? I mean, I know it's a very broad question, but can you apply your mind to that? Yeah, broadly speaking, I think that the biggest issue that, that we see is a lack of patience. Often it's the case that it takes a long time to be able to fully estimate what the impact of a decision is. And post any given decision, let's say a government changes its fiscal policy or there's a change in government, there's an immediate market reaction in the absence of a wider range of information. And often the, the most practical approach, the most profitable approach is to be patient, to wait for a bit more information, to have a fuller picture before you react. And reacting continually and to new information and buying and selling is, is one way to avoid benefiting from the, the long-term accruing of equity. So I think that the best approach in a volatile period is to batten down the hatches, ensure that you have sufficient safe haven assets in your portfolios, and then Act patiently and and wait for opportunities and take advantage of those as they appear. Chris, I've been looking at the RAND over the past uh, couple of days, and it really does at times resemble a roller coaster at Gold Reef City. So what do we expect from currency markets due to this uncertainty and risk associated with the elections? Difficult to call, I would imagine, in the very short term. Very difficult to call, I would say, even in the medium to long term. I mean, the, the currency does fluctuate wildly, as, as you've have pointed out. And the best that we can do is try to gauge what we think is fair value for the rand. And by that, I mean, if we were to trade just like a comparable commodity exporting emerging market country, what would the rand be? So if we took out the SA specific considerations, no load shedding, or the other SA specific concerns that we have around transit, et cetera, et cetera. Where would the RAND be? And if we were just the typical commodity exporting emerging market in this environment, our estimate is that the RAND would be about 17, 10 or so. So everything above that is extra risk premium in SA for the SOEs and all the other sort of stuff that's happening in SA. So that's that's the best case scenario. 
Now, let's assume that post-elections we see continual improvements in ESCOM, i.e., that is to say, it's not just a ploy ahead of elections, but it's genuine, and actually the market starts to see load shedding is still reduced after elections. That means we see a reduction in the risk premium in SA, and let's assume that we continue to see improvements in, for example, Transnet and a, and a few other SEs. That means that we head towards that 1710, but we can't get there. I don't think anyone here realistically thinks all the SA-specific problems are going to disappear in, in six months, even under the best case. In which case we sort of get halfway there and, and our expectation is by the end of the year we're at 1770 or so. But we need to be clear that there's a wide range of outcomes around that. I mean, there's a lot that could happen by the end of the year. So rather than it being our expectation, it's really just a, a gauge of, of the fact that we think the RAND's more likely to strengthen than, than weaken. All right, Chris, sit tight. Uh, we will continue this conversation in just a moment with an assessment on why South African elections matter in the global context. First, I do want to remind you that Chris has his own program on Investec Focus Radio in Macro Monday, which drops weekly. He gives a 10-minute update on macroeconomic and market moves. It is definitely worth a listen for any investor. To listen, please follow Investec Focus Radio SA wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the channel, please take a moment to rate us. Chris Holdsworth, uh, welcome back. Uh, let's start with this now. What economic indicators then do you think are going to be impacted by the global elections? What do we need to be looking out for? I think first and foremost, it's bond yields. And there's a secondary concern, and that is while central banks globally typically are independent, they are likely to be affected by these elections. And what I mean by that is if it is the case that we land up with governments still deciding to take on large deficits, still land up with debt to GDP going up, while there's limited need for it, so we've got unemployment rates that are very low across developed markets, that implies that we likely see inflation proving to be stickier than expected. That means that central banks, in effect, will be put in a corner and they'll be unable to cut as much as markets, I think, would like. So I think that's the concern. We land up with governments with still very aggressive fiscal policy, and that leads to higher inflation, that leads to higher rates. And so what we need to watch out for, first and foremost, is shifts to fiscal policy. So as these new governments come into place, we need to watch out for what their announcements are with regards to their budgets and their expectations for the deficit. And then based on those, we'll be able to make adjustments to our inflation forecasts and, as a result, our interest rate forecasts. Chris, of all the elections, the American poll is probably the most important, but there is a school of thought that the long-term effects of American elections have minimal impact on investor portfolios. Do you agree with that sentiment? It's difficult to say. I don't want to cop out completely, but if one has a look over time and you you look at performance of the markets under different administrations, that is Republican versus Democrat, and if you look under different controls of Congress, there there are differences in returns for the S&P over the past 100 years or so as a result of different administrations. Now, whether that's just an artifact of the data and it's not something that's systemic and it might not be replicated. It's one of those things where, unfortunately, it's it's too soon to tell, even with a hundred years worth of history. But in in the medium term, it's quite clearly the case that that markets do react to what happens in in politics. I mean, we've seen in the US when Trump came into play, for example, he had a material impact on the equity market. And so I I would suggest that these changes in politics are significant for markets in at least the short term. And that means probably the medium term as well. Chris, we're having this conversation two weeks out from the South African election. There must be market or investor concerns as we head to the polls. Foreign investor confidence in this country remains depressed, and you've already alluded to the structural challenges that continue to weigh heavily on this country. What is your sense? We chat to other investors quite frequently, and I used to be on the sell side, and we were going to chat to foreign investors all the time. We'd we'd be displaying what we think is opportunity in SA and trying to gauge what sentiment there is for risking investment in SA. And I think globally at the moment, we're sitting in an environment where most investors are willing to just wait and see. There's no point taking a big bet ahead of an election if you're a foreign investor. There's only downside risk. Why bother? So I think what we're likely to see is foreign investors still sitting on the sidelines until A, we get the result, but B, even post the result, we still need to see what impact that result is going to have on domestic policy. And that's going to take a little while to, to come about. So I think at best, we're probably looking until February next year when the budget is 
announced before we land up with foreigners really willing to meaningfully take a stake and, and a risk in SA. And until then, it's probably worth their while to sit on the sidelines and wait to see what develops. Let me push you a little bit further on that. So you're talking about results. There's every likelihood then that we will have some form of cooperative or coalition government. We need then to watch out for economic missteps as a country. What is concerning you? As soon as we thought that a coalition was likely, we embarked on a project to go and figure out what impact coalitions have on both growth and more broadly the markets. And the the good news is that there's very limited evidence across emerging markets that coalitions directly by themselves lead to lower GDP growth. What's more important is the strength of the coalition agreement. So for our purposes, what we need to watch out for when on the assumption that there is a coalition, when that coalition is announced, or how is it structured? Is it the case that there's a minority government, which would be very fluid, very disruptive? That would be quite bad for, for local growth and as a result, quite bad for, for local equities too. Or is it something that's a bit more robust and is cemented in place through you know, some cabinet positions, for example? The second thing to look out for is across emerging markets, when there are coalitions, it typically results in higher deficits. And the more coalition partners, the higher the deficit. Because coalition partners, as part of the the broader coalition, have their own mandates that they wish to extract finances for. And as a result of that, we need to have a look at, A, how many coalition partners there are, but B, what do those coalition partners want? And as a result of that, we might have to revisit our expectations for deficits in South Africa, and we'll probably only really be able to get a firm handle on that post-February. And Chris, finally, let's wrap up the conversation. And this question could equally apply to investment or the Comrades Marathon. But let me take you back to 2020. Dr. Daniel Crosby, he's a leading behavioral and finance expert, spoke to Investec Wealth and Investment. And he said this, success comes not from anticipating or forecasting what comes next, but from staying the course. Those words ring true at a time like this, don't they? Yeah, it comes back to the point about patience we said before. I mean, if if you just look at markets in any given year, uh, they can be up 5%, they can be down 5%. But you look back over 10 years and, and suddenly those incremental positive returns all accrue and they offset the negative ones and you land up with quite significant returns. And that's the case even in South Africa, despite the decade that we've had. And so this is clearly an argument for patience with regards to investing in equities. And it goes far as to say, if one doesn't have patience, then the really equities aren't for you. You have to be willing to to take the risk over the long run. And environments like we're going through now look very murky, but we've gone through environments like this fairly regularly over 100 years or so. And you just need to to be able to withstand these periods of volatility, to be able to enjoy the benefits of accruing risk premium. And that was a very telling and enjoyable conversation. Chris Holdsworth, thank you very much indeed for joining me on No Ordinary Wednesday. Please join us again in a fortnight as we continue to explore money trends shaping your world. If you haven't yet added us to your podcast feed, please search for Investec Focus Radio SA wherever you get your podcasts and just hit the subscribe button. Until next time, goodbye from me, Jeremy Maggs, and the entire Focus Radio team. The views expressed are those of the contributors at the time of publication and do not necessarily represent the views of the firm and should not be taken as advice or recommendations. Investec Limited and subsidiaries, authorized financial service providers, registered credit providers, and long-term insurer.